Well, Lenny, in this presentation, we're going to focus on primary stapedectomy. Uh, you know, the reason, <laughs> the reason for this whole website, really. And I think first, uh, uh, let's do a uh, diagrammatic presentation. Um, then we'll show a movie of the same thing that we're going to do diagrammatically. So why don't you go ahead and do the diagrammatic presentation. Thank you, Bill. Uh, we will start uh, with our first slide uh, illustration of how we make the initial incision. Uh, several points prior to discussion, discussing the incision, we use a concentrated 2% uh, lidocaine, 1 to 10,000 epinephrine injection. Once the patient is sedated, we use a nasal speculum to dilate the lateral portion of the external auditory canal and inject slowly in at least four quadrants. Uh, once the patient is uh, further sedated, we'll do a more medial injection in at least four quadrants with the same anesthetic. We will take a, a speculum and then dilate the ear canal, usually starting with a four or five millimeter uh, speculum and irrigating the ear canal out to wash out any debris. Uh, we make sure that we see the lateral process or short process of the malleus uh, so that we can uh, create a adequate tympanomatal flap. We will take a number one uh, myringotomy knife or a Guilford in order to create the incisions and they are short strokes starting superiorly, extending out about six to seven millimeters and curving inferiorly and continuing uh, back towards the annulus. That would be the superior incision. Mm -hmm. Then you're going to make an inferior incision and end up with almost a V. So there are mm -hmm. two incisions that then meet in the middle. We do uh, switch hands. For instance, when we operate on the right ear, uh, the superior incision we will make with the right hand. The inferior incision we will make with the left hand. And then we'll connect those two uh, incisions with our uh, posterior incision. I recommend uh, practicing in the bone lab using both hands. Um, we will also use gel foam soaked with lidocaine and epinephrine for hemostasis. We uh, will then uh, uh, create the stability using the speculum holder with the largest speculum that we can use. If there's a significant amount of bleeding that can't be controlled with the gel foam lidocaine epinephrine, uh, we will occasionally use a cautery uh, by touching the suction very gently. Lenny, uh, let me just add one thing about the speculi. We start with the we start with a smaller speculum, but then we add, you know, we add a size each time and we get larger. And what we do is while we're irrigating and while we're injecting, remember the speculum is oval shaped we will turn the speculum so we're dilating the canal with the speculum. The, the speculum eventually, the larger speculum will achieve two things. It will give us the largest possible field with the largest possible speculum and it'll be tight enough that we have hemostasis from the speculum. The speculum holder will also immobilize the patient's head. Some patients when they're groggy under sedation will have a tendency to move. Once we've completed the incision, we use a blunt elevator, it can be a Guilford, it can be a number two knife, which is triangular shaped, or a Rosen knife. We elevate towards the annulus. We identify the annulus. We will often increase the magnification from 10 to 16. And then we will use an instrument called a light blunt, a curved blunted instrument, to lift the annulus out of its groove uh, from the superior incision down to the inferior incision. Uh, we highly recommend that you search for the annulus in its superior portion. It's much easier to identify it. You will also avoid uh, tearing the flap or perhaps tearing the tympanic membrane uh, uh, where that would happen if you're exposing the area inferiorly. Once you lifted up the annulus, we will take a gel foam soaked epinephrine lidocaine sponge and place it in the middle ear. This helps with the uh, hemostasis as well as uh, with the uh, uh, local uh, anesthesia in the middle ear. We will then 
identify the chorda tympani and we will search for the malleus. Uh, it is very important to palpate the malleus. A certain percentage of otosclerotics will have a fixed or partially fixed malleus and it's a good habit to get into for all your chronic ear work or your stapedectomy work. You'll sometimes have to rotate the table away in order to see the malleus, and we really prefer to see the malleus and palpate it. In a very anterior malleus, you'll sometimes only be able to palpate it, but that's quite an unusual uh, circumstance. Uh, in stapedectomy, uh, a totally fixed malleus is the, the only malleus problem that is a problem. If the malleus doesn't move quite as well or is almost totally fixed but not fixed. This is not a fixed malleus. We've done studies on that. We'll get the same results with a malleus that moves around like this as one that moves a tiny bit. So we use the same instrument every time and totally fixed means exactly that. Unless it's totally fixed, it's not going to be a factor. We will generally curette uh, from superior to inferior and starting lateral to medial preserving the chorda tympani nerve. We will dissect the chorda tympani nerve out of its groove. We want to see the facial nerve, the facial canal. We want to see the pyramidal eminence so we can see the entire stapedius tendon. Also want to make sure that you have room for your incudostapedial joint knife. So look at the facial nerve, the origin of the stapes tendon, and do I have enough room to separate the incudostapedial joint. Exposure is the key to all surgery and even more so in microsurgery of the middle ear. It is crucial. Dr. Lippi, when I trained with him, often said, if you explore a middle ear, you don't see adequate curatage. It was an inexperienced surgeon. This can't be uh, overemphasized. We will use moistened gel foam pledges to remove the uh, curatages because we don't want bone spicules uh, sitting under the tympanomatal flap or getting in the middle ear, which could cause a future fixation problem. Our next slide uh, illustrates the excellent exposure that we've mentioned. It is, it is very important to palpate the superstructure, but even more important to palpate the foot plate. Uh, we might be deceived by some motion in the superstructure area, therefore it is critical to palpate the foot plate. That is the decisive examination to get the diagnosis of a fixed stapes and otosclerosis. Once we have diagnosed that, we will then make a control hole in the foot plate area. This assumes several things. One, that we can see the foot plate. We might not always see the foot plate because of an overhanging facial nerve or facial canal and or an overhanging uh, promontory. We might make a control hole by palpation. Preferably we want to also see the foot plate and palpate it in order to make a control hole. This also assumes that the foot plate will be thin, which we know that is the case in the majority of patients, and or mixed. If it is solid or obliterated, we will not be able to make a, a hole in the foot plate with a barber needle. We make the hole in the foot plate for several reasons. One, this will avoid an incidental uh, mobilization of the superstructure. It will also protect the inner ear in the case of a perilymph gusher. Uh, this will also allow proper entry of further microinstruments in order to extract a portion of the foot plate. Once we've made our, con our control hole in the foot plate, as you mentioned, Bill, the exposure for the incudostapedal joint is critical. To try to separate the joint without proper exposure will only lead to greater difficulty. And this is something that you've emphasized to me over and over again, and it's been really uh, very beneficial. Uh, we will take the joint knife and gently palpate the incus so that we can see really where the joint is. And in a slow uh, seesawing action, we will separate uh, the incudostapedial joint in the direction or in the plane uh, of the stapedius tendon. In other words, away from the tendon, away from the tendon. The tendon is what gives us the stability. Absolutely. You don't want to cut your tendon first. That's what gives you your counter tension. 
to properly separate the ankylostapedial joint. Once we've separated the joint, our attention now uh, goes to the tendon, Bill, and uh, we might rotate the patient a little towards us to better visualize the tendon and the foot plate area. We'll take a Bellucci scissors and cut it as close as possible to the pyramidal eminence. The reason we do that is so that any remnant of tendon won't be in our visual field or in the field of our microinstruments. You know, Lenny, uh, throughout the years, uh, there have been various surgeons who suggested doing just the opposite, uh, leaving as much of the uh, stapedial tendon as possible and trying, trying to connect that to your prosthesis for blood supply. We found out that we, we've tried it and it, it's very difficult to do, so we would rather, since it's not going to work anyhow, we would rather have that uh, stapes tendon completely out of our way. And that's the reason for cutting it as close to its origin as possible. Now that we've separated the joint and cut the tendon, we will now down fracture the superstructure. And we use a number three instrument or a foot plate chisel. And uh, we will down fracture it towards the prominentory and uh, this will enable us to see the entire foot plate. We do remove the superstructure entirely with a cup forceps once we've down fractured towards the promontory. I think it's necessary that, to mention there, if you lose the superstructure, don't go hunting for it. Uh, it can stay in the air for 100 years and it's not going to hurt anything. Uh, that's a good, good time to bring up the thing we talk about all the time. Don't be a neat surgeon. In other words, if you don't go hunting for the superstructure. If you uh, later on, we'll talk about fragments in the foot plate or in the perilymph, leave them alone. Don't be compulsive and go after things because that's where you get into trouble. Now we have a good shot at the foot plate. We have our uh, small control hole. We will make a number of uh, holes right next to the uh, hole that we had pri made prior to this, and we'll try to connect them. And we'll usually do this in the mid portion of the foot plate or the posterior third uh, in order to destabilize that portion of the foot plate which we want to remove. Once the uh, holes have been connected, we have a large enough area that we can remove that posterior portion of the foot plate easily with a left lippy or a larger hook. And uh, we will place it uh, deep to that remnant of the foot plate and pull this laterally and it might come out in one or two pieces or it might come out as a whole posterior portion of the foot plate. Lenny, uh, I, I don't particularly like this slide because most of the time we'll take out the posterior two-thirds of the foot plate or at least the, the posterior half. Do you agree with that? I think uh, that's correct. It also depends on the size of the foot plate sure, sure. and the extent of the disease. We've talked about this quite a bit that uh, if it is a very small foot plate, we might take out the whole foot plate, right. or if it's a very diseased foot plate, uh, very advanced otosclerosis or even tympanosclerosis, we're in favor of taking out the whole foot plate. Whereas if we have a large foot plate with a thin foot plate, we will take out, be more conservative and take out just a posterior half or posterior third. Correct, correct. But that's right. But more often we, in most cases, we're in a blue foot plate, we have like the posterior half out of there. Rather, than, I don't want people to think that it's just the posterior one-third. Mm -hmm. yep. Once we remove that portion of the foot plate, the posterior portion of the foot plate, we will then uh, irritate and abrade the mucoperiosteum on the prominentory side, and in addition uh, on the facial nerve side, so that we get an excellent take uh, between the graft and the mucoperiosteum around the oval window area. Uh, we'll do this with a hook so that we can then place the uh, vein graft adventitia down. You can see uh, that this covers the entire vestibule area uh, so the patient will have less uh, side effects such as dizziness and it also uh, prepares an excellent site to stabilize uh, the medial shaft of the prosthesis. One of the things, Bill, that we have discussed is how do you place the vein graft? And, uh, I always observe that you place the vein graft inferior to the cord of tympani. There's just more room there, whereas the prosthesis will place above the cord of tympani in most cases. So these are two general principles that I think can be applied in the great majority of cases. 
Uh, the vein graft uh, has a, a dimple created with a small suction, a 24-26 suction, uh, so that when you take a alligator forceps and pick up your uh, bucket handle prosthesis, you'll place it right into that dimple and it will self-center. Uh, the next uh, maneuver will be to tilt the microscope away and perhaps the patient slightly so that you can see the ink is better and we will take two instruments, uh, one called an incus hook and you'll place that in your left hand and a strut guide in your right hand and you'll simultaneously uh, lift up the incus and gently press down with that strut guide on the bucket handle. Uh, first you'll place your, your incus hook uh, medial to that incus and you'll lift up and uh, in most cases, this will almost go in instantaneously. Uh, the incus uh, lenticular process fitting very nicely into the bucket handle.